1776, Adam Smith famously wrote the following. When an animal wants to obtain something, either of a man or of another animal, it has no other means of persuasion but to gain the favor of those whose service it requires. A spaniel endeavors by a thousand attractions to engage the attention of its master, who is at dinner, when it wants to be fed by him. Man sometimes uses the same arts with his brethren, and endeavors by every servile and fawning attention to obtain their good will. But man has almost constant occasion for the help of his brethren, and it is in vain for him to expect it from their benevolence only. He will be more likely to prevail if he can interest their self-love in his favor and show them that it is for their own advantage to do for him what he requires of them. Whoever offers to another a bargain of any kind proposes to do this. Give me that which I want, and you shall have this which you want, is the meaning of every such offer. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the baker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interest. We address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love. Nobody but a beggar chooses to depend chiefly upon the benevolence of his fellow citizens. So as we can see, Adam Smith was really optimistic about the ability of free markets to bring about egalitarian social relations, where we trade with one another on terms of respect and to our mutual advantage. Now, less than 100 years later, Karl Marx had a very different impression about the free market. And here's a quote from Marx. The sphere within whose boundaries the sale and purchase of labor power goes on is in fact a very Eden of the innate rights of man. There alone rule freedom, equality, property, and Bentham. Freedom, because both buyer and seller of a commodity, say of labor power, are constrained only by their own free will. They contract as free agents, and the agreement they come to is but the form in which they give legal expression to their common will. Equality, because each enters into relation with the other as with a simple owner of commodities, and they exchange equivalent for equivalent. Property, because each disposes only of what is his own. And Bentham, because each looks only to himself. On leaving this sphere of simple circulation or of exchange of commodities, which furnishes the free trader vulgaris with his views and ideas, and with the standard by which he judges a society based on capital and wages, we think we can perceive a change in the physiognomy of our dramatis persona. He who before was the money owner now strides in front as capitalist, possessor of labor power, follows as his laborer, the one with an air of importance smirking intent on business, the other timid and holding back, like one who is bringing his own hide to market and has nothing to expect but a hiding. So according to Karl Marx, the free market ideal is wonderful in theory, but in practice, it doesn't realize the freedom and liberty that it promises. In practice, it leads to social relations that are profoundly inegalitarian, where some bow and scrape in front of others, others who hold arbitrary and unaccountable power over them. So what's the explanation for this dramatic shift between Adam Smith and Karl Marx? Well, uh, according to Elizabeth Anderson, the answer is really simple. The answer is the Industrial Revolution happened. And what I'm going to be doing in this video is talking about the story that Elizabeth Anderson tells that goes from Adam Smith, actually even before Adam Smith, up into Karl Marx. And if you want the full story, you should really take a look at Elizabeth Anderson's Tanner Lectures from 2015 at Princeton University. I'm going to include a link to that in the description of this video. But here what I'm going to be doing is just taking us on a little tour of that story that Anderson tells with a little bit of commentary along the way. Let's begin by talking about some terminology. Now, the first term I need to introduce is the term egalitarian. 
The word egalitarian means different things in different contexts. Sometimes by egalitarian, what we mean is that everybody has the same uh, stuff. Other times what we mean is we're trying to equalize equality of outcomes along some particular dimension. But in this context, what we mean by egalitarian is that the citizens of a society are able to interact as equals. I might not have the same job as you or the same amount of money as you, but I'm not going to bow and scrape in front of you. I'm not going to humiliate myself in front of you. Now, according to Anderson, there are three types of pernicious hierarchies that can get in the way of an egalitarian society. One of them is a hierarchy of authority. Then there's a hierarchy of esteem and a hierarchy of standing. A hierarchy of authority is one where occupants of higher rank exercise arbitrary and unaccountable power over their inferiors. In a hierarchy of esteem, occupants of higher rank despise inferiors, and inferiors bow and scrape in front of them. In a hierarchy of standing, the interests of occupants of higher rank count more than the interests of inferiors, which may be disregarded entirely. So imagine that you come to work for me in my philosophy counseling and consulting company. And things start out really well. You show up on the first day and I say, you know, glad you're here. Uh, I've been doing this for a lot longer than you have. So I have a bunch of ideas that I've seen work over the years. So here's how I'd like you to do the spreadsheets. Here's what time I'd like us to start work in the morning. Um, here's what I think works when customers complain and yada, yada, yada. But I do value your opinions. So if we get to a point where you think that you have some idea that's not working, come and talk to me about it. So if one of the ideas I'm proposing doesn't work, come talk to me about it. If there's something that really isn't working for you also, let's have a conversation. Now in that workplace, there is a hierarchy. I'm giving the instructions. Uh, but it's not an egalitarian one. We're, stable, we're still able to interact on terms of equality. We're still social equals. It's just that we're currently working in an environment where it makes sense to have a particular hierarchy where people with different levels of competence occupy different positions. But the hierarchy in that workplace could easily switch so that it becomes profoundly inegalitarian. Let's talk about some of those ways. So imagine if you show up to work one day and all of a sudden I'm like, you got to wear the color yellow on Mondays. And on Tuesdays, Tuesdays are, are, are for the color blue. You got to wear blue on Tuesday. And when you're on your break, I really don't like you talking to Susan, so you can't talk to her anymore. What I'm doing now is I'm exercising arbitrary and unaccountable power over you. So we've now established a hierarchy of authority. What I under would call a hierarchy of authority. Then suppose that the next day I say, you know, I really want you to give me a bow when you see me. And don't make eye contact with me. And I really want you to refer to me as your holiness. Now I've created a hierarchy of esteem where some bow and scrape in front of others. And maybe the final thing I do is I say, you know, when I'm making decisions about how the workplace is going to go, the only person whose interests I'm going to take into account are this guy's. I'm not paying attention to your interests anymore. Um, what you want doesn't matter. What matters is how I want the workplace to go. Now what we've created is a hierarchy of standing, where the interests of some are just completely ignored and overlooked, while the interests of others are taken seriously. So to check your understanding, what I want you to do is to pause this video, and I want you to describe a workplace that has a hierarchy, but there still could be egalitarian social relations. So in other words, the people are still able to interact as social equals, even though there's a difference in the distribution of labor. And then I want you to describe ways that you might change that description so that it turns into a situation where there is an inegalitarian society because of these hierarchies of authority, esteem, and standing. And then once you've done that, you can keep playing the video. We can now understand the disagreement between Karl Marx and Adam Smith. Adam Smith thought that the uh, free market ideal was going to lead to an, egal an egalitarian society. Well, Karl Marx thought that the free market ideal leads to inegalitarian societies characterized by hierarchies of authority, esteem, or standing. So let's trace this idea, and we're going to actually have to start in 16th century England. So put yourself in the shoes of somebody who lives in 16th century England. Unless you're the king, you're going to be ruled by somebody who has arbitrary and unaccountable power 
over you. If you are a priest, you have, uh, you're being ruled and dominated by a bishop. If you are a parishioner, you're being ruled by a priest. If you are a married woman, your husband has arbitrary and unaccountable power over you, and you can't even own property. If you are a worker, your boss has that kind of power over you. If you are a sailor, your captain has that kind of arbitrary and unaccountable power over you, and so on. And against this backdrop, there was a group called the Levelers that began to fight for egalitarian ends. So they, the different Levelers fought for different things. Some fought for women's liberation, the right of women to own property and to make divorce easier. Others fought for the rights of uh, you know, religious freedom. They fought against the Anglican Church, which at that time had their own like court system that could uh, try you and fine you. Others fought against the guilds that also had their own system of taking people and fining them and putting them in jail if they violated the guild rules for like pricing goods, for example. A crucial component of this fight was a fight for free markets. And what they wanted was the right to own property and to freely trade it without the interference of the church and the king and the guilds. According to the levelers, free trade was going to abolish monopolies and create more work opportunities. So the upshot is that the levelers thought that the free market was a, was part of a big part of a solution to the inegalitarian social relations that characterized uh, early modern England. Adam Smith shared this vision in the 18th century. According to Smith, the free market was going to be the thing that took us away from the hospitality-based economy of feudalism. So what does that mean? What is the hospitality-based economy of feudalism? Well, well, basically, it's like this. If you are a feudal lord and you have all these surplus goods and there's no market where you can easily like trade, trade it for something else, what you do is you give it to people. But it's not free. Like Gifts aren't free. You give it to people and then what you get back in return is their loyalty and their devotion and their commitment to bow and scrape in front of you. And the result of this was profoundly inegalitarian social relations, where people would come and they would bow and scrape and beg in front of these feudal lords who would then exercise arbitrary and unaccountable power over them. In a society based on market exchanges rather than feudal hospitality, there isn't any single feudal lord who has the authority to dominate a worker completely because no worker is completely dependent on the generosity of one single feudal lord. And in this way, a move from feudalism towards a market economy was a move away from inegalitarian social relations and towards egalitarian social relations. Now, one thing that is really important to note is that when Smith was talking about a movement away from uh, feudal hospitality and towards a market economy, he didn't have in mind the gigantic factories that we think about today when we think about contemporary like uh, manufacturing. What he had in mind were things like small button factories, where maybe you'd employ like 10 or 15 different workers. One of the most famous passages from his famous book from uh, 1776, The Wealth of Nations, describes such a factory, and I'll read it for you now. One man draws out the wire, another straightens it, a third cuts it, a fourth points it, a fifth grinds it at the top for receiving the head. To make the head requires two or three distinct operations. To put it on is a peculiar business. To whiten the pins is another. It is even a trade by itself to put them into the paper. And the important business of making a pin is, in this manner, divided into about 18 distinct operations, which, in some manufactories, are all performed by distinct hands. So that was Adam Smith's vision of what the free market was going to lead to. Uh, free market ideology was going to lead to a state of affairs in which there were these small factors, factories were moving towards like universal self-employment or at least the ability to engage in self-employment because with all these new opportunities for trade, there would always be more room for somebody to just build their own new button factory and then enter into the market and compete. Now, in the, at the turn of the 19th century, the United States was starting to look like it was the manifestation of these egalitarian uh, ideals uh, based on a free market economy that looked like the sort of factories that Adam Smith had in mind, where we're having these like small factories and, you know, uh, self-employment. And the reason why this was the case was because uh, the majority of the population was self-employed and unpaid labor was diminishing. Now, 
we need to acknowledge something. Slavery was legal in the United States until, what, like 1865. But we also need to not forget something. By 1804, uh, all the northern states had already outlawed slavery. Now, so things were looking in the United States like they're moving in the direction of this free market uh, ideal that was bringing about egalitarian social relations characterized by um, majority, you know, self-employment. But appearances were deceiving. And Anderson talks about like three main reasons why they, why they were deceiving. So, so first of all, this worked for men, like a lot of men, but women weren't always able to, or not even always, like women were cut off from these new advances in egalitarian social relations at, uh, in the 19th century. And what you have to remember is that the main way that women were contributing to the economy at that time was through domestic labor, and that was unpaid. And they were still being dominated in the household by, by men. So that's one thing. Another thing was the Civil War. So the Civil War was a huge advancement in terms of, you know, bringing about egalitarian social relations because it, it effectively ended in the United States the ability of one person to own another human being. But at the same time, one other thing that the Civil War did was it ushered in a new age of industrialization. And as I'll talk about a little bit later, that was the final nail in the coffin of the egalitarian ideal being, being uh, brought about through an unfettered free market approach. And then finally, celebrating self-employment at the expense of celebrating other forms of employment creates a hierarchy of esteem. Those who were self-employed are held by higher, held in higher esteem than those who are not. So the ironic thing is that a form of employment that was originally seen as a manifestation of the egalitarian ideal was celebrated in a way that was contrary to the realization of that ideal. I think it's a really interesting point that, uh, that Anderson makes. Now, as I hinted at before, the Industrial Revolution crushed any hope, any last hope that a, uh, a, an unfettered free market approach would usher in an egalitarian society. And the reason why it did that was because Adam Smith's vision of a world where there's these small factories, these, these small button factories, like he describes in the beginning of The Wealth of Nation, is replaced by a world where you have these gigantic monstrosities that are just belching like soot and black smoke into the sky, um, employing hundreds or thousands of, of, of workers who are no longer working alongside their bosses, if the bosses even work at all. And what's interesting is that you had this economic ideal of a free market that promised egalitarianism, which resulted in a profoundly inegalitarian state of affairs. It resulted in these private governments in which bosses ignore the interests of their workers and arbitrarily and uh, unaccountably exert power over them. And the workers in return bow and scrape. So it did not lead to the liberation from hierarchies of authority, esteem, and standing, but to the entrenchment of those three kinds of hierarchies. But what exactly are these private governments? Um, are, they, are they all that bad? Is there an alternative? How can we engage in criticisms of these governments while still acknowledging that uh, the you know, hierarchically organized firms are more efficient than other models that we've seen. I'm going to turn to those questions in my next video. So thank you.